Hello, hello, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Louis. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's very nice to speak to you. And um, this is a great show, Louis. It's a great show. Oh, great. You watched it then? Yes. Oh, brilliant. That sounds like I could have been talking about my own program. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was talking about Extreme Love. I've not seen the second one. There's two, aren't there? There's, yeah. You've made one about Dementia. Does that go out next Thursday? That's next Thursday. And tonight is, is about autism. So Extreme Love, is it 9pm tonight, Louis, on BBC Two? Yeah, 9pm tonight, BBC Two. It's about parents of children who are diagnosed with quite serious autism. I think a lot of us are used to the images from the media, like Rain Man, where he's got special abilities, and then cases where the kids are quirky and eccentric, but but still verbal and often highly intelligent. The, the kids I'm looking at in this uh, in this documentary are, are much more challenged than that, and and several of them can only speak a few words and, and are occasionally uh, violent and have these um, tantrums where they sometimes attack their parents. And uh, there's, there's some incredible scenes in there. Um, scenes that I don't think I've seen caught on camera before in relation to you know people having tantrums and all episodes uh, who, uh, who are afflicted with autism. Let's examine it more in a moment. Just in, in, in general terms, is this a departure for you? A lot of your shows, are, all your shows, I guess, are about people living at a bit of an extreme of human existence, but they're often about people who've made a choice. Well, that's yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and whereas, in fact, in that respect, it really is a departure because obviously no one chooses to have a autism or to have a, a a son or child with autism. Likewise, Alzheimer's and dementia. What you do find though is once you're in that situation, you are faced with a choice, a very a very incredible. I mean, in a way, the most difficult choice you can imagine, which is what what you do about it, and what your next step is, if your child is to the point where he is um, having tantrums and assaulting you on an almost daily basis, H- how much of that can you stand before taking the terrible step of putting the child in a group home, which is what one of the parents that I interviewed had done. And, she, and, and it was the right decision, wasn't it? Because she said that he seemed happier and he would come home and see her at weekends, but at the end of that weekend he, he, was, he was always keen to go back to the group home. She uh, she had found it an enormous wrench, and she said it was the right decision. And at the same time, I think she had ho- terrible misgivings about it as well. So she was still dealing with it. And that's the other thing, I suppose, about having a child uh, with with serious autism, uh, where he's you know disabled, where you know you you actually have to be a that child will never be fully independent, and so you are going to be a parent in in the full sense of almost raising your child into adulthood and for the rest of your life. Let's put, I'm going to play two clips here, which I think really uh, very effectively illustrate the show. And there's a couple of really good points within here that I wanted to, to talk to you about. There's a young man called Nicky in the show. And uh, here he is uh, talking with his mother, or perhaps it's you talking with his mother, about why he has to go to a special school. I think it's maybe him and his mum talking, but it's why he has to go to a special school for extreme autism called DLC. A few miles away in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, lives Mary Ingrassia. Hi, Mary. Hi, Lewis. How are you doing? A teacher nice and the mother you. of Nikki. How has Nikki done at DLC? Nikki's done great. They have taught Nikki way above and beyond my expectations. What would yeah, stop him from I going to a mainstream school? I Forget it, I can't go. I think go. Um, just the idea of normal children. Being bullies? Yeah. There's kids that I have problems with in my classroom, and you know what? This morning, I was so angry, I said, oh, I'm going to stab this kid if he doesn't shut up. If he doesn't... Nikki, what did I tell you about talking like that, though? It's freedom of speech, Malta. No, no you can't do that. What did I tell you about talking like that? Never do it. Never do it? And what'd you do? I just said it anyway because I was Why? angry. Why? Because I was angry. I'm sorry. And despite his autism, his mother says she wouldn't change a thing about him. If you could take away Anything. Nicky's autism, would you do it? No. Why not? Because he's too special. He also does so many Access things that, that... you never seen before. I mean, I don't think any of my other children could do what Nicky does. Why don't you bring it in here, Nicky? Nicky's written a number of dictionaries and also a novel called Dragon Law, which he was keen to show me. These two are Japanese books, which are my, which is my favorite language to learn. And I'm starting to write the entire alphabet in haragana, katakana, and kanji. Do you speak Japanese? Yes. How, how do you say hello? My name is Nikki. Konnichiwa, watashi wa nikuas. <laughs> Just a couple of things I want to ask you about that. First of all, were you surprised by the mother's answer when she said she wouldn't take away his autism if she could? Um, no, I wasn't because actually Nikki was. 
uh, he, he was he was a very funny and appealing and a lovely warm guy and and he through some strange quirk through this you know this autism is a really weird condition it, like it, it it's so strange in terms of the range of behaviors it, it, it encompasses and the degree of progress you can make within the diagnosis and and Nikki was one of the uh, people who'd having not been able to speak at all uh, until he was age six or seven, had suddenly, as you can hear in the clip, w- was was inc- very verbal, very witty, and 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 writing these books and stuff. So it was easy to see why, um, you know, you would be, you know, you would, imp- and you, you can't separate Nikki from the condition as well in a strange mm. way. Like, would Nikki without autism be Nikki? Not really. He's a great kid as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's a nice kid. So 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 he sort of represents, in a way, in, in this. In, in the scope of people I was speaking to, the best case scenario of how much progress a kid can make with the right yeah. intervention and, and whatever quirks of how the, the condition progresses. There are other cases where, unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the kids don't make that kind of progress. He also, because you mentioned the, the, the Rain Man image, the Dustin Hoffman image, where I think a lot of us think that people with autism have these uh, sort of extra abilities, that, it, that in certain singular directions they're much more intelligent than the rest of us. And, and there we heard Nikki talking Japanese, for example. But I think, am I right thinking that actually it's, it's very rare that you come across kids with autism who have these abilities, these savant abilities? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an appealing and understandably you know, appealing to the media and to... To, it's it's nice idea that oh well you've got disabilities but they're compensated yeah. by an amazing prodigious gift but that is very much the exception and even Nicky I, t- I mean I hope I'm not um, talking out of turn but he he really didn't speak Japanese um, he he had a few words and he'd copied dictionaries out um, but he he did not in any really mean if you plonked him down in Tokyo and said go buy yourself a hamburger he would have been uh, completely out of his okay. depth. Was it difficult to ask parents if they, you know, you do ask some challenging questions in the show and sensitive questions. Um, I think you, at one point you, you ask a parent if they effectively love their children any less because of their autism. Do you find it hard to ask parents sensitive questions like that in their own home? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an awful question to ask. And, uh, you know, I, I don't feel especially uh, great about asking those questions sometimes, but... At the same time, uh, I think you've got. You know, I'm a journalist, and I have to. Uh, you, you sort of have to sometimes go. You have to go to those difficult, difficult places, and it, and it gives the parents obviously an opportunity to let their feelings let their feelings be. You no, know, sometimes I feel like you've got to go to the darkest place to sort of to get to the to extract the positive in a weird way. Yeah, I understand. There's some great reviews for tonight's show, and I mentioned we had a couple of TV critics on the show on Tuesday who were uh, calling it uh, your best work yet. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um, there, was, there was a review in The Observer that said you tread a fine line between I- intrusion, between observation and and intrusion. Is, is that how you felt as you made the show? I think it's, you know, with these very personal stories, you've got to be aware of that. And it it's... I think I do tread a fine line, and and one of the my favourite scenes in the whole film is there's a moment where a kid called Joey is having a, a violent tantrum, and he's lying on the floor, and his mum's lying on top of him to try and restrain it's him. An extraordinary scene. And I say to her, it, it was kind of embarrassing. I thought, you know, for me, because I, I, I wasn't quite sure wh- whether I should be there or not. And I said to Carol, the mum, "Would you like us to leave? We'll step outside." Yeah. And she said, "No." I want you to stay. It's very important that you stay here. This is true autism, what you're seeing right now. And that, when I said earlier that I think you, you seem to catch on camera episodes I haven't seen before. I mean, there's a scene where both his parents, I think, are pinning him to the ground, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, I've never, they seem to be extremes of autism that I'm not aware have been broadcast on television before. Well, I'm no expert, but I haven't seen, you know, I was aware in doing the research and watching the uh, a few docs before I made this one that it seemed to me a little bit as though the true nature of what people experience uh, the families of autistic kids and the kids themselves that it hadn't really been depicted that it, that people don't really want to think that hard uh, about what is is really happening because it's so difficult uh, you mentioned watching other documentaries who are your favorite documentary makers Oh, uh, Who do you admire? I like Werner Herzog a lot. He said yeah. had a run on Channel Four with about Death Row. Um, Michael Moore, of course. He, I, I have to mention him because he gave me my break in TV. 
Um, uh, you know, I, he's not really a documentary maker as such, but I, I always credit Alan Wicker as having been the kind of pioneer of uh, virtually every subject that I've done. In, in what way? First. Well, that he, th- there's a certain... Um, he, he was basically the, the quintessential British guy always in his suit with his moustache, his hair perfectly combed, and he would put himself in these strange situations. And he did stories on plastic surgery, uh, um, dict- you know, dictators in corrupt countries, uh, celebrities, uh, police, crime, all of those stories that I l- later covered. And in a stra- he was the straight man in a crazy world. And I don't know that he did autism, though. No, and and, and, and the, sort of the common thread between all, all of your documentaries is that they're all about people living at the extremes of existence. Is that fair? Well, I would go one step further and say they're about forming human bonds with people who at first glance you would characterise as extreme and trying to bring out the normal side of uh, unusual behaviour. They're about you forming a human bond. Yes, me getting to know and forming something like friendships or at least some human contact with people who... Uh, you 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 would ordinarily you just sort of see the label you know whatever label's been put on them, and I mean you, and you do that here with both with Nikki who we talked about, um, and there's there's a, a young man called Brian in your film, isn't there? And he's he's has a, he's right at the far end of the autism spectrum. He's the kid I think isn't he who uh, burnt down his house. That's right. He he burnt down his parents' house age eight and or nine I think, and then um, was repeatedly. And, and regularly, I think, um, assaulting his mum, and then to the point where his uh, mum called the police and, and Brian was taken off to a psychiatric hospital. And now he's in a group home, and and, and he, he barely speaks. And, and what, I was a little, I, I'll be honest, you know, I was a, I was a bit nervous before meeting him because I, I'd heard so many stories from his mum about the, what she'd gone through at his hands. And then when we met we sort of seemed to hit it off a little bit. And I actually really had a very enjoyable afternoon in, in a sort of non-verbal way communicating with him. Yeah. You know, you've struck up a rapport with him. Yeah. Um, as you did with Nicky and one or two other people in in the show. And it's a, it's a very effective and a very, I think, very important part of the programme. By the way, someone's messaged me from the office saying, Alan Wicker once made a great documentary about a nunnery. Did you yeah. see that one? You know, I didn't. But when they they, they did um, some re they did a sort of anniversary or they did a, sh- a series maybe last year where he he got in touch with some of his greatest shows and saw the people again and they showed that one. It was power- he he had that knack for going in t- and asking the very difficult question. There was a scene where the you basically see the nun telling her parents that she's going to be a nun for the rest of her life. And their reaction is 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 unreal. Oh, I'd love to see that. Who's that other documentary maker? The guy that made Kurt and Courtney. Um, Nick Broomfield. Nick Broomfield. Do you like his work? I, you know, I like Nick Broomfield. Uh, I, I feel I get compared to him a lot, and I, I I do see that there's a big difference in as much as he he he's all about the quest, and and I sort of feel like for me it's a given that you're there, you're in the the room. You know, I I don't make a, a feature of going. You know, the attempt to find the story. No, so when you get you, you, so you think that the when people compare you to him, it's not a, an accurate comparison. Well, I see why they do because it's sort of he pioneered the first per, a certain first person approach where he's in the frame and asking questions, and he he's sort of deceptively um, laid back, but actually you can see that he's got this. He's pretty focused and, and tenacious. So all of that I see as a fair comparison. But you know, he's coming out of an independent film kind of. Uh, you know, cinema verite genre, and I think fundamentally, I'm coming out of you know, for for better or worse, I'm like, I'm making TV, and I accept that. Are you deceptively laid back? Then is that how you describe what you do? Well, that's what I said about Nick Broomfield, but I don't no. But know you that... then said I can see why people were comparing yeah, me to I him can... because he's deceptively laid back. I see that I don't I don't attempt to be more laid back uh, than I am, but I do think that I I I, I am aware that I'm trying to. Um, I don't know. It's really hard to explain. I I am kind of a little bit of a sh- shambles a lot of the time. I don't dress terribly well, and 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 I am trying to ingratiate myself with the people that I meet by being, you know, not intimidating, by not being bossy, and that's how I am in life too. Um, at the same time, I I do have a pretty clear idea of what I'm trying to get out of any given um, interview or any, encounter. You know, I do think I'm pretty focused when it comes to the. The journalistic agenda, and you want, but you want to disarm people. Well, disarm is one way of putting it. You really want people to um, 
you, you, it's like the word you use was rapport. It's about making, you know, you want people to feel relaxed. You want pe people to feel they can tell you the truth. Uh, some great texts are coming in. Let me just read a couple out before we take the news. Uh, Alan in Sheffield says, I'm so excited about Louis' documentary tonight, which is BBC Two, nine o'clock. I work in a school for children with autism and feel sure that the programme will not only focus on the children's struggles, but also how wonderful and amazing they are, opening so many people's eyes. This is Alan in Sheffield, which you do, Louis. Very much so, because I think um, the charm of the kids and, 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 and how how much they do have to offer and how enriched uh, the parents are in loving the kids, in raising the kids, I think really comes across. There is one slightly desperate couple who are sort of in the thick of, I think in some ways the kids when they're six, seven, it's a particularly difficult time. And that was my observation anyway. And there's one couple who, and the, and the mum is is uh, just in such a difficult spot in terms of being filled with angst and exhaustion. But across the board, uh, in, in all the other cases, you do see the parents and how, how much they are getting from, from their relationships and how much the children have to offer. Two more texts for the news. Uh, this is Richard uh, in Scunthorpe, who says, My 19-year-old daughter has autism, brackets, Asperger's, and I can't wait to see the show. The stigma in life about this condition is unbelievable and sometimes very hard to deal with. And Lisa in Longriston in East Yorkshire says, My son is five and has severe autism and has no speech. I would just like to know why Louis filmed the documentary in America rather than here. I'm very much looking forward to it, but I know it will make me wish my son had access to fantastic facilities like they have in America. You know, I, 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 do, I do tend to do shows in America. So why, why is that? To, yeah, to some extent, it's, it's become a habit, but I think it's to do with the size of America. The, you know, there's 300 million people there. It's the world's only superpower. It's... It's just a cradle of all kinds of fascinating stories and it always feels as though whatever we're going through here in Britain, somehow our understanding can be enhanced by examining the very, you know, the different experience that they have over there. And plus we found in New Jersey, that one in 29 uh, boys is now being diagnosed with autism and it's got an amazingly high rate. And going along with that is has, has some of the best facilities anywhere in America. So it felt like a good place to do it. The fact that one in 29, because I think the, uh, an average in this country is about one in 100, I think. That's right. It? And I think that may be including both boys and girls. But boy, but girls tend to get diagnosed at something like four or five times. So, sorry, boys tend to get diagnosed four or five times the rate that, that uh, girls do. In other words, it's much more common in boys. But if it's one in 100 in lots of other places and it's one in 29 in New Jersey, it's just a curious figure, isn't it? And is it, does that, would that indicate that it's partly environmental? I don't know, but this, there must be a reason for that. Well, there's there? a few th th ideas that get thrown out. I mean, rates, I mean, one is that all, because services are good in New Jersey, that it's a magnet for people to actually move there right. if they have uh, autism in the family. I think the other thing is that, it, and, the, and the medical staff then become more sensitised to it, and, and it gets diagnosed at a higher rate because they have the expertise to diagnose it, as opposed to places like Alabama where it would be much lower. But then I think you know there's a broader trend where diagnosis is going up, and that is actually a mystery. I think you know there is a bit, there is a mega trend of increased uh, autism, which no one fully understands. I think. Uh, Louis, loads of people are getting in touch. Lots of parents are getting in touch. Uh, who have children with autism, who are very much looking forward to the show. And a lot of them are saying that um, people don't really understand uh, autism. I, I mean, it, it, is, it is difficult to understand, isn't it? it very much so. And uh, one of the tricky things is, uh, you know, you, people don't know whether it's genetic in origin or environmental or a, probably a combination of both. And, and you know, when you test f for it, the tests involve... Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a, a blood test or a genetic test or even a medical test in the in the normal sense. You know, it's to do with responses and s fundamentally, autism is about social interaction. It's 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 a, it's a sort of disability of social interaction and very often repetitive behaviours. So those are the two big things. Has anyone ever got past it? Uh, got over it? Yeah, ever... there are cases of kids who are diagnosed and then they seem to grow out of it. I think it's rare though. And within the you know the diagnosis, the spectrum is so broad. You know of of how some kids seemed to me very outgoing and sociable, like Brian, notwithstanding that he couldn't really speak, and then other kids seemed completely inward-looking and withdrawn. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, the positives as well. One thing I I wanted to say was, 
you do tend to get um, a very refreshing, if sometimes brutal, honesty from the kids. You know, that one of the kids uh, I interviewed told me my questions were were boring and bland. And it's almost that, you know, in, in a certain lack of or na- naive understanding of, of, of other humans and hu- human em- emotions and how other people experience emotions can have this other side effect that they, they that a lot of the kids would be very direct and that they was you know, very honest and that there was no sort of side and no manipulation. You Everything was out in the open, which was, you know, really good. Yeah. yeah this Nikki, uh, who you form a nice rapport and a bond with, uh, who is the the young man we heard about earlier? His mum said she wouldn't take away his autism even if she could, and he finds out about. He goes on on the internet and finds out that uh, you are quote a celebrity in the UK, and he gets very excited by that. And it's quite funny. See, he's on your Wikipedia page, isn't he? In That's right. And he starts reading it out aloud to me to my obvious discomfort because you know why do you? I was watching that thinking well, you you did seem uncomfortable that he was reading out your list of. TV credits in the UK. Why, why were you uncomfortable with that? Well, okay, that's a good question. There was two things going on. One was that, um, you know, I make these shows not to be about me. Like, there's no point me finding out about me when I go off to New Jersey to find out about autism. I know that uh, my dad is a travel writer and that I have Italian heritage. But the other thing was, like, I thought he was, I, I, you know, there's always this note. I have a back catalogue th- that involves sh- shows that were sometimes taken to be uh, a little bit uh, teasing or or sometimes, you know, I would do shows about UFO believers and, and maybe it doesn't seem that serious. So I was a little bit afraid of being unmasked as the guy who does stories about wacky people. And then they'd think, you know, oh, well, is he the right? He, he was represented to us as a serious journalist from the UK, BAFTA award winning. Oh, and I then see. suddenly they think, oh, no, we've got uh, this, this, this kind of clown. Yeah. <laughs> You feared perhaps that they would think that maybe you were there to ridicule them. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, as strange as that may. The thing is, though, I feel that I, we've been evolving for so many years that I can't. I don't always. I don't go around thinking that I'm the guy who does light-hearted stories about Americans with funny beliefs. Uh, and I, I, and and then sometimes I think maybe I'm deluding myself that the the audience that will forever be my tag. But maybe Bill- these shows will do something to to finally. Uh, Get rid of that whole Maybe. perception. Because there was a point, wasn't it? It was more, I think, when you were doing the celebrity shows with the late Jimmy Savile, for right. example, and uh, an Al Whittacombe where some critics wondered if you were trying to ridicule the, the people who were the subjects of those shows. That was said at the time, wasn't it? Well, I think another thing happened, which was that um, I think there was a, a feeling that I, I, I'm holding these people up for scrutiny, yeah. and yet I'm somehow immune from it. And then as I became... And then somehow I was sort of profiting from or benefiting from the association of being of making the show so that I was becoming more famous, in other words. And then it's like, well, he's a celebrity too. Why doesn't someone make a documentary about him, you know, meaning me? And then it all became very confused and, and complicated. I remember your UFO documentary. It was good. Didn't you speak to a man who said he'd killed... Ten Force, aliens. Ten aliens. And another right. one who actually claimed to speak alien. Like an alien would speak through him. He was a space channel. Do you ever go? How, what year was that? How long ago? That was. Uh, I, th- I think I made that in ninety six or ninety seven. Oh. Do you so ever go more, back and watch your old stuff? Well, you know, I'm not supposed to plug other shows, but I, I, I did a. Um, I do sometimes, and that UFO one I think holds up pretty well. And then I did one about the porn industry that we've actually. Mm-hmm. Um, We've, I actually went and did an update on it, mm. and uh, so that will be coming out later in the year. Great, and that will be on BBC Two as well, yeah. will it? Would you ever go back to the celebrity stuff? I wouldn't rule it, rule it out. I would have to think carefully about w- what I was hoping to get out of it, you know. But you know, absolutely, the right a good idea is a good idea. So I, I, I haven't, you know, in a, in a sense, the celebrities kind of gave me up. Rather than the other way around. What do you mean? You put in some requests and people just started saying no. Well, it you know, who have did you, you request said, that wouldn't let you film? Who wouldn't let me film? Yeah, I mean, Tony Blair. I mean, who? Where do you want to start? I mean, there's always. Have you ever been turned down for it? You know, maybe I should ask your producer. I mean, of course, it happens. You can't book time. everyone you want. Oh yeah, all the time. Um, uh, let's let me read a couple more texts before we finish, Louis. So it's tonight at nine. It's tonight at nine. It's, uh, extreme, it's a tremendous show. You actually, before I read out these texts, which we'll finish with, just to, I have not seen next week's show, no. which is about dementia. Why don't you just tell us a bit about next week's you show? You know, I'm going to go back. The, the question you should have asked was, have you ever had a yes from someone and then decided not to make the okay. show? Have, Louis, have you no, ever, Louis through? Have you ever had a yes from somebody and then decided not to make the show? No, I couldn't possibly. That would be. Don't tease me like that. 
<laughs> Next week's one is about Alzheimer's and dementia, and it's set in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> and it looks at the difficulties and the challenges and the strange compensations of having a loved one who uh, can basically no longer remember anything. Okay, and it's the dementia's been in the news quite a lot lately, hasn't it? I think David Cameron talked about doubling funding research for dementia. It's an amazing number of people in this country, aren't there, that are diagnosed with dementia. It's something like 800,000 people, I think. Well, what we find is that as we get better and better at keeping people alive and keeping their bodies well, that we haven't kept pace with uh, keeping their minds well. And so that's why cases of Alzheimer's and dementia are going through the roof. So who did you say, uh, who did you get yes from but didn't film? I think maybe... I can't say. Oh, no, I can't. No, you know what? That's really bad karma to say, to advertise. To, I can't go there. Uh, Carol in Glasgow, our daughter Natalie, has severe autism. Thank you, Louis, for showing... I think uh, Simon real. Cowell would have done it at one point, and then, and then... You must regret not doing that. Yeah, we missed the boat on that one. What year was that when you it asked? It was before he even did... Um, before he was doing whatever it was, Pop Idol or... You, know, that, was, you were very early on to yeah, the Simon Cowell Yeah, it was when he was still idea. managing five, if you remember that group. And Simon Cowell's name was on the wall. And was like, well, he'd do it, but no one knows who he is. And he said, you approached him and he said yes. I and couldn't go like, that far. No, it was just there was a sense that he might be available. How did you know of him before he was on Pop Idol? Because uh, he managed five and we were talking about getting a boy band, doing something about a boy band. And Do you remember five? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of managers of bands out there, though. But you were yeah. But he was he was known as the Sven, uh, He yeah. was the go-to pop Svengali, and it's like, well, it'll be an interesting portrait of the pop industry. We had no idea who was going to become the world's richest man. Ask again. I mean, look at that book that's coming out this week. Look yeah. at the rich material. He, you know, he. I've met him, and he seems like a nice man. He has black loo paper. Um, my son. That's just one of the many details from the book that's coming out. I believe this week. <laughs> Uh, a, couple of, a couple of texts before you go. So I was reading one there. Our daughter Natalie has severe autism. She's 14. Thank you, Louis, for showing uh, the showing real life. We love our daughter very much, but some days are tough. Your program might help people understand. That's Carol. My son is uh, on the uh, ASDO. What does that mean? Um, and he works at autism spectrum, I guess it refers to, doesn't it? And he works as a gardener. He's 21. Never had a girlfriend and not many friends, but he learned to drive a car. He had a, a lot of help at school, but I had to fight uh, for help all of the time. Just want to thank Louis for bringing autism back into the headlines. We have two amazing boys, four and six, were both autistic. And it's fantastic to raise the awareness and improve people's understanding about this disorder, says Helen and Mark in Colchester. Is that rare that two kids in the same family have autism Louis, well we know? we've had a we covered a family and both the kids they were twins were uh they were non-identical twins they were both autistic i think it does sometimes run in families so there is a suggestion that it may be genetic for, for that reason sandra and paisley i have two sons with autism and i'm looking forward to the show tonight giving a glimpse into our lives so many texts on this and so many from parents of kids with autism it's it's a it's a great show and it's i think it's an important show louis and um uh, congratulations on it thank you 